We are back. Hello and welcome to Vantage Sportsnets. We have issues. And I think we do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm we Noah Fins. You know Mark Robbins. And uh, yes, and our esteemed panel of guests today, uh, starting with the sports doctors in the house from the Danton and London, Keith O'Brien. Pete Pagagua from Game Time CT, moving over from uh, the old days in, in Meriden at yep. the Record Journal, right? And uh, the, uh, the esteemed columnist from the Hartford Current and an author of a book, uh, A Franchise on the Rise, that uh, you may see our interview segment uh, on CT uh, Sports Now here. Dom Amore is with us, and uh, we're, we're thrilled that you guys are here. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having us. Gentlemen, yeah. let's get right into our issues. Let's start, Dom, with you. You're, uh, you thought you may have a quiet summer, and then that <laughs> went away real quickly. This Kevin Ollie story uh, and UConn. Catch us up to speed. Tell us, tell us what we what yeah, you know. Yeah, it's well, it's a story that won't go away. And and you know, the long story short, uh, it's a god awful mess. It's a mess on all sides. Uh, it's a game that nobody's winning. Everybody looks bad. Nobody looks good here. Uh, and right now, the best thing that can happen is for both sides to get in a room, find the number they can live with, find language that they can live with that you know where where Kevin feels like his reputation is not damaged and call it a day and get out of it. But that doesn't appear to be in sight. Both sides are very dug in. Uh, both sides seem to think it's an open and shut case on their end, but it is not. It's very complicated. There are legit arguments on both sides. So they're arguing over this $10 million, and you have to feel like there's, there's room for a, a compromise there somewhere. With a number but, that big, but, sure. But, someone, sure. but someone's got to be willing to, to move a little bit. How much in your mind is it damaging the program? Well, it's not helping. I mean, it's bad publicity, and really, you know, in the court of public opinion, you know, UConn is not necessarily losing in Connecticut because there's a lot of anti ollie feeling in Connecticut because they lost. But to the outside, in the national conversation, mm -hmm. you know, it's laughable to suggest that they fired Kevin for any reason other than, lo than losing. And so this just looks, the university kind of looks cheap, looks petty, really looks ridiculous. So UConn is losing, I think, in the court of public opinion, in the national college basketball conversation. And that's somewhat damaging to the program, especially if you're recruiting you know, nationally. Now, I think they have momentum with Dan Hurley as the coach. It was a popular hire. It was a good hire. Uh, I, think, I think he's going to do a good job. But this is not helping him. It may not be hurting him much, but it's not helping him. Let, let me ask you real quickly, Dom, is this about the $10 million, or is this about somewhat protecting the, yeah, we were just getting rid of you because we weren't winning? You, you, you know what I mean? I mean no, I, I, don't think, I don't think UConn would have a problem with that if it wasn't for the money that was on the line. This is about the $10 million. You know, UConn Athletics, we all know, is cash-strapped. They're not getting the TV money. They're not getting Power 5-type money. Right. Uh, th they're being subsidized more than... As, as, as much at least as any other school in the country, they don't have $10 million. So, it, you know, that's why another school would probably absorb this and just make it go away. They signed the contract, they'd honor it. UConn just doesn't have the wherewithal to do that right now. And that's why there's a certain amount of desperation, I think, on their end to get out of this without paying them. Now you talk about, you know, the national level. It just seems like UConn has become almost irrelevant in the last two or three years, you yeah. know, with the conference, That's you know, with the step back the program has taken, right. is, is Danny Hurley now have an upward battle, and is this holding him back? Well, that they've become irrelevant in the basketball sense. This has made them relevant for the wrong reasons. Because right. now they're getting, now they're getting, now they're getting, you know, Dick Vitale was ripping them for not having talent. Now mm -hmm. he's ripping them, you know, for this. I think Dan Hurley is the, was the right hire at the right time. I think he's uniquely equipped to make them relevant again because of the Hurley name, because of the of what he did at Rhode Island, because he was a guy that a lot of bigger schools wanted, UConn was able to get him. That was essentially their last chance to prove that this was still a destination job. So I think he's the right guy to do it. I do think this is holding him back a little bit, but I think he can break through this if they settle it fairly soon. You guys are tending to think too, as soon as this is done, wash your hands of it, Let's right. start moving forward again. Right. Start I started, right. oh. and listen, I, you know, I, I started looking backwards. And I think that UConn's problems are bigger than, than Kevin Ollie's. And yeah. I think that Mike Trangizi, the head of the, uh, or the, you know, the, the 
head of the Big East back in the day. I think he and his team and maybe athletic directors throughout the old Big East were a little short-sighted in seeing what was coming down the road. Everyone right. talked about it. Everyone knew that this conference realignment was coming. You had Notre Dame in the conference only in basketball. You needed to get a commitment out of Notre Dame and say, you're either in or you're out. You're going to play football right. to some extent. And the ACC <coughs> got Notre Dame to do that. and uh, not, not completely in, right, but right. somewhat in. And then maybe you were the initiator going after, uh, maybe you went after at that point Maryland. Maryland right. was not right. happy in the right. ACC. Right. Right. There were schools that you could could have gone after, and then maybe you're not losing Syracuse, Boston College, and Pittsburgh in one fail swoop, and, 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 and Miami and Virginia Tech before that. So I think UConn's problems are bigger now because of what the, the what I consider short-sightedness of everyone in the Big East and the people who are at the Big East office. You know, a lot of it was beyond UConn's control. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They got left behind in it. It's not, it's hard to actually point, necessarily point the blame in one place. But the thing that kind of sticks in my mind, thinking back on that period of time when Syracuse and Pitt left the Big East and that really started the, the breakup, yeah. UConn was caught in a situation where they were pushing Jeff Hathaway out as athletic director. Right. That process took a long time. Uh, you know, and he was a guy, whatever his faults were, had good connections in the NCAA, mm -hmm. was well-connected nationally. It took them a long time to push him out they had a, an interim uh, AD, Paul Pendergast, for yeah. six or seven months. He was miscast. And then it took several months to find Ward Manuel and get him in place. And by the time he was in place, the damage had been done. So they were without, really without a, a, an AD and without a strong, connected AD at a critical, critical time. And they never really recovered from that. Yeah, it was, they've been it, playing catch up ever since. Kind of like the perfect storm, and they had right. no captain on the on right. you know, on exactly. the bridge. And you look at you look yeah, at they, Randy they, Etzel yeah. for the football program when he left. They were playing in a in a BCS bowl game. Right. And now he's trying to build the program back up. How? And there was a, an article recently. I think I saw in the Hartford right. Was it yours, Dom? No, about it wasn't. But, but yeah. okay. Our, but our but, new but, Kelly Stacy. Okay. Oh, very nice. But 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 John. the the idea that. They need to get people in that building right. and start making some money. Well, you know, that's, that's a, a situation that you have to be realistic about what kind of market this is. There are a lot of college football markets in the country where they're going to sell out no matter what they do. I mean, Nebraska could have a lot of disappointing seasons in a row. Yeah, right. They're going to sell out. There are some college basketball markets like that. This has always been a bandwagon yeah. market. There are well, too many certain. pro teams. Certainly. We're too yeah. close to Boston and New York. If you don't win, people are not going to come. And to see three or 4,000 people at Gamble Pavilion is shocking, no matter who. But they're not winning. Now, True. I believe that the first couple of games next year will be sold out oh, because absolutely. of Dan Hurley. And New if, coach, they, and if sure. they win them, it, it'll start to build. I think they will get the basketball fans back. But football, you, 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 know, you have to win. And football is, a, is, a, is, is really unlike... Unlike men's basketball, where there's 100 teams that could win every year, you know, you can look at the AP Top 20 in 1977, yeah. 87, same 18, 20 teams. It's hard to break into that into well, that pack. Well, Noah used the term short-sighted, and I think uh, that that UConn has been short-sighted for years when it comes to the football program. Ever since they decided to 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 build and and go to Rensselaer Field, you cannot be a Division One program and take football away from your campus and they yeah. had to they had to put it there they didn't well you remember at the time right it was being married to well, the patriots, married to the patriots but <laughs> even if the patriots had the <laughs> patriots <laughs> come <laughs> had the patriots come it's it wouldn't have helped uconn football no i don't think no it would not have helped the no but the UConn idea was football. to share no, stadium. Because, because i understand you know that what? but you yeah. you you don't draw yeah. Yeah. and nobody uh, those students aren't coming and Nobody's, nobody's, and it's really it's hard, hard to get to too. Now, I mean, Cabela's is fun though. <laughs> <laughs> get there early, you go, you go to Cabela's, but, but and again, walk around. All, all, <laughs> have a good time. For, for all of yeah. these things, if UConn's 8 0, well, you yes. you're not going to be able to smell a ticket. Sure. That's, that's the way this state is. If sure. they're 8 0, well, that's the way you it, won't be able to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, I think there well, are other But they're going to have to beat right. some good teams. They're going to have yes. to be 8 0 again. Yes. And they have a good schedule right. coming up, right? They You know what? You know, the AAC, the American Conference is not, in football, is not bad. No, no, and, it's and, not and, as bad as the yeah. rap against you. And, right. and if they if they could stay in football in that conference and go to the Big East in basketball, that's a perfect. That world, would be isn't perfect it? world. Yes. And and the way to do it would be to switch with Creighton, 
Like yeah, Creighton yeah. beat, right? But Creighton, of course, will never, <laughs> will never no, go. I, I like yeah. seeing UConn play against Providence College. Well, I yeah. like seeing UConn yeah. play against Villanova. Yeah. And that's what we all grew up. Tulsa and Tulane no, doesn't do it for you. Doesn't move the needle. Yeah, for you. yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and again, and, and, and you know, I don't blame fans for feeling that way because yeah, that's that's what UConn the basketball is. The big Civil is. War game against Central Florida. <laughs> yes, the conflict, the civil conflict. We don't have a conflict. We have issues. That's our show. We're going to take a quick break and come back. More issues to talk about here on Vantage Sports right after this. Welcome back, Vantage Sportsnet. We have issues. It's our esteemed panel of uh, uh, sportscasters, sports writers, and uh, people who just love sports. And, and you, know what, you, you know what's driving me up the wall? Is what parent? It seems that parents have done a wonderful job of ruining youth and high school sports. Yeah. It just and, and, and <laughs> I, 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 I really I get worked up when I start thinking about it. And when I'm at the games, I'm embarrassed for some parents. I want to say something. I can't. Uh, eventually, I'm going to. But it. Y- that's why we have the show. I, so that's what okay. We're so I right can say now. it now. We're talking about parents and and their effect now, and, and it's come down uh, to the high school level uh, really, really hard. Most recently, a couple weeks ago, Paul McNulty, who's a legendary lacro- high school lacrosse coach, uh, has resigned and publicly said because of what he fears is uh, the parents of the incoming students in the next couple of years at Staples High School. He, he was uh, uh, a state winner uh, at Wilton and, and has done a marvelous job with the uh, Staples program uh, for many, many years, and he has stepped away, which is an absolute shame. And I know, uh, Pete and Keith, you guys want to talk about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I covered Staples and Wilton for a couple of years, and, uh, I mean, Wilton's been known to run really good coaches. That's so the fact that he coached at Wilton and Staples is wildly impressive. <laughs> um, but <laughs> and you said it before. You know, you feel embarrassed for the parents. I feel more embarrassed for the kids. Yes. I mean, you know, you we we go to games. We're on the sidelines. We're really close to the action. And you got you know Johnny's mom yelling about you know why isn't Johnny in the game? The team's getting blown out, sixteen nothing. Oh, sorry, Johnny's not going to make any big. Uh, doesn't matter how good Johnny is, not making that big of a difference. And you know, you just you feel for these kids because they're sitting there and they got their hands on their head like, stop talking. But um, I, I think in addition to that, parents are setting a horrible example for the kids. When you hear parents screaming at referees, uh, umpires, oh, and, and, yeah. and when you hear parents screaming, that's a terrible call, you're an idiot. I mean, I, I hear them regularly yeah. saying that. What are you telling your kids? You're yeah. telling your kids you have a built-in excuse for why you're not going to win this game. Yeah. What we want to teach the children in the, uh, through really through all youth sports, through high school, is we don't make excuses. We work really super hard. You deal with what is out there. Don't put yourself in a position where that's going to hurt you. And you know what? At the end of the day, you'll learn how to win. You'll learn how to lose. And, and sometimes the circumstances are... Yeah. Yeah. out of your control and, deal with it yeah and even you know sitting on the bench even if you're you know there are multiple af- there are a lot of athletes in this state that play multiple sports just because you're the best baseball player doesn't mean you're going to be the best basketball player but being on a basketball team and maybe sitting the bench even if you shouldn't you know maybe you think that you're playing but you're not that teaches you how to be a different kind of teammate and that will help you when you're the best player on the baseball team right. and yeah I mean and you mentioned you know referees and stuff there, there was a story recently that there are no youth referees or high school referees who in their right mind would sign yeah. up to do that. You couldn't pay me oh, all the money yeah. in the world to sit there and be berated by parents and, for three and, hours and, on the weekend. And let me just, and Keith, I know you want to get in on this, but but I've seen games where the referees are high school kids. You're talking about 14 and 15 year old kids who are being paid $15. I'm talking about youth sports, like little girls soccer, like 11 year old girls playing soccer and parents yelling at the referees who are just kids themselves. What is the matter with you? Like, this is all just for fun. This is all to get our kids involved. It, 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 that's, uh, that's the toughest thing for me. You know, and it, it, anybody, um, I spend nine months out of the year buried in high school sports like Pete. So I'm around all of it. Coaches, referees, ADs, parents. One of the big things that hurts sports on a high school level, in my opinion, is the travel, is the AAU, is the year-long stuff. Because, let's face it, anybody can do that. But not everybody can play for the high school team. Not everybody's good enough. But because you play for your travel team or your AAU team in the summertime, you go into your season, you know, thinking your son or your daughter is, you know, Michael Jordan or the next LeBron mm-hmm. James or, you know, the, the next uh, Chris Dunn, you know, yeah, or he's yeah. the next uh, you know, Gra- Matt Harvey. So yeah. everybody has these high expectations yeah. of their kids. And you know what's lost in a lot of it, guys? It's fun. Yeah. is just have some fun. 
You don't have to be the best. And the parents, because they're shelling out the money for the travel, There's because they're shelling teams. out the dough, everybody thinks their kid yep. is going to play Division One sports. I'll throw you some quick numbers. Eight million, eight million student athletes, okay, nationwide play high school sports. Would you guess how many of those eight million go on to play college? Was it me? Oh, uh, well, I'm sure. College, uh, uh, very few. Like, very like, few. Like two percent? Yeah. Six uh, percent. Six percent. Oh, wow. Four hundred and six thousand. That's division one, two, three, and junior right. college athletics. Right. So your chances of going on to play at the next level are very slim. Out of those four hundred thousand, how many of those actually go on to get to play for pay? Oh, a half a percent. Two thousand. Well, are you including uh, college when you say pay for pay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think what yeah. happens is Every parent has these expectations of their child that are extremely lofty. Do you think their expectations for their child, or do you think it's a little vicarious? Well, that's, well, that's, that's a, yeah. see, that's the common thread uh, in all of this. And you know, this is not new. I no. mean, you think about you know, the movie Bad News Bears was about this, and that was 45 years ago. It carries on to college sports. You know, we've seen LeVar Ball, and it starts to carry on to that. And what's lost in it, the common thread in all of this, it's about the kids. It's not about the adults, and the adults want to, wh whether it's the parents or even, you know, some coaches, not many, but some coaches, but mostly parents want to make it about them and not about the kids, and it's about the kids. It's, it's, it has to be. It has to be uh, about the kids, and that's, that's where we, we really see it starting to get away from the right. kids, and that's when you want to pull and your those hair of out. And those of us who cover high school sports, as I did earlier in my career and occasionally now, you guys do it all the time. For you, it's about the kids. You want to write about the kids. Yes. I don't want to write about, you don't want to write about parents. You don't even want to no. write about coaches except for exceptional cases. You want to make it about the kids. Yeah. Even at the co college level, and, and, and Keith, I know you want to jump back in here, but I remember talking not long ago to Tom Penders, who was a heck of a, a college basketball coach, right? He worked at programs at University of Texas, at Rhode Island, at George, uh, um, was it, uh, George Washington. George, mm -hmm. uh, George Mason. George, no, no, George, George Washington. Washington. George, George Washington. Washington. Right. And he said the thing that drove him up the wall, and this is at the college level, right, where you figure the coach is, mm -hmm. you know, knows enough to know who should play. And the thing that drove him up the wall, and eventually he said, I don't want to do this anymore. Parents. Yeah. You know, the crazy parents. Did, but do you think it starts with, like, you first, like you talked about all those programs. I mean, there are a thousand AAU programs. All you need is, you know, back when, and this wasn't that long ago, back when I was trying out for summer baseball teams, you actually had to make the team. You know, if there wasn't a if you didn't make the team, you played for like a lower league. You Anybody just didn't, can make the team now. Yeah, right. anything. Yeah, it's it's not, not, it doesn't mean yeah. anything. Yeah. And uh, do you think it starts with that, and, like the younger AAU programs and all these travel, baseball, softball, basketball, soccer teams? I think it's a whole these, perspective. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we could be part of the blame, too, with the way that we cover some youth well, sports and, I and think, little league I think and Babe yes, Ruth. Yeah, so yeah, I think there's some blame to be had. these kids are super Don't get me wrong. You know, Chad Knight at Staples is the – rare exception to the rule of an amazing little league story yeah. go on to be a great baseball player who's going to a great college but not every kid's that and i no. feel like when we cover them at that young of an age their parents think um, that they're going to have a, a ride i don't know how many times i've gotten emails from parents being like my my son or daughter's name wasn't in the paper how are the schools going to notice them right. look if duke is reading well, what i'm writing you know right. thank you well that no but that's <laughs> that's not happening. See, that's that's the other factor as well is that parents have these lofty expectations they're looking for scholarship money. They're looking for maybe pro money. And then when it doesn't happen, now they're looking for someone to blame. It's the coach's fault for not playing them. Oh, yeah. It's the media's fault for not covering them. The, you know, that's, that's where the everything kind of starts to get skewed. Again, that's not new, but in the world we live in today, it's much more intensified. And not and it all, get to us but many quicker. of these air-quoted coaches mm -hmm. are more pariahs looking for money, looking for a quick payday because they understand the parents with the expectations. I would love oh, to be, I yeah, would yeah, love to travel, run in the travel That's level. what I'm yes, saying. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't think you see it as much yes. at the high school level. Well, but. not no, at the high school yeah. level, but I mean at the tr with travel. That's why they're getting into it because it becomes a money maker for these it's, coaches. There's so much money involved. They are making money off should we wait, should we start a team? Off, Do you want to start a team? Organizing <laughs> teams. They're yeah. getting they're getting paid by uh, Athletic uh, uh, equipment companies. Let me just let me just say, and, and this is this is another problem we have in this country. We've touched on this before, but my daughter, who's not even twelve years old yet, is playing in a soccer league. She's fine. She's a good player. She's probably not going to play at the next level, right? It's four thousand dollars to play in this <laughs> soccer league. Yeah, four thousand dollars. 
So who are we including in these premier leagues, in these travel leagues? We're including the kids who can afford it. Not, yes. not all right. the athletes. And that's a whole, right. that's a whole yeah. other it's issue. It's not premier. It's not elite. Right. Yes. Because if you can afford it, you will play. For, right. for, the, for the most part. For, for the, the most part. Right. Absolutely. Well, if and you're good, you're good. You're going to play. But if you can afford it, yes. you'll play as well. And that's where people make a lot and a lot. Right. Of, I mean, and, and, soccer is right. the most popular sport in the world, right? Why? Well, because countries, third world countries can more easily afford it. That's why there's more success. That's why we don't, I mean, we can get into the World Cup and why we don't get, we're not successful. But soccer is a a, a basic sport. You need a ball, a field, you know, so so you don't need $4,000. To, to, to play the no. game and, well, apparently uh, every week. And, 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 and but I'll somebody's making money, so you do, because those nets and the grass, it doesn't, you know. And <laughs> professional sports are full of guys who, when they were kids, couldn't afford to play travel teams. They played for who they could play for, their high school team, yep. American Legion team, whatever it was. There. But if you're good enough, they'll find you. The that's, co- that's, that's what their job absolutely, is, to find you. That's ab- and and even, even before social media and before the Internet, and before videos and all of those things, they'll find you. Keith, you I'll know, let you have the last word, then we're going to take a break. And my advice to the parents out there, if you're going to criticize the coaches, if you're going to criticize things, the referees, go do it. Volunteer your time. Go coach. Yes. Go ref. <laughs> go do it. Then come yeah. tell me how easy it is to, to mix in all the kids, especially on a high school team. Yeah. Go tell me how, how easy it is to deal with all the different personalities. Right. Give it a shot. Then... You will have the platform to grind the body. You'll have, you'll Go have a lot do of it. fun. Very you'll nice. Have a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, one of our panel members, at least one, believes that the CIAC is actually holding back the progress of its student athletes. We'll talk about it coming up next here on CT Sports Now. We have issues. issues welcome back to we have issues here on vantage sports net we're having some donuts and having some good fun and some good conversation i think we're saving the world we we are and, and you know doctors save a lot of lives and, and keith o'brien the, the sports doctor you want to save and, and i think you you bring up an excellent point with the problems that some high school ho- coaches have uh during their off time in the summer yeah well there really is no off time guys i mean now you have the basketball summer leagues, especially in our end of the state, the, the passing league in football, uh, the seven-on-seven leagues and stuff like that. And coaches, high school coaches, are not allowed to coach their kids during the summertime. But if you go to the games, well, they're 15 feet behind the fields on chain link fence, relaying in plays to college kids who have come back and are coaching the teams. And if you go to the basketball games and the basketball leagues, and whether it's an AAU or travel or a summer league, the coaches are either up in the stands texting whoever is coaching the team and relaying information. <gasps> My question is this, is who is better to coach the kids? A coach who is certified through the state or, you know, some parent who we've got to help out a little bit? And why, why is that? Why are we so, so hand-tied with these rules? So, so here's one of the reasons that... Um, in conversations we had with uh, Reggie we, Hatchett. yeah Reggie yeah. Hatchett, the Weaver basketball coach, is that, and he he is in favor, by the way, of of, of coaching his players during during the summer. Right. Um, but the the idea is that if you have a team, you're the coach of the team, you have the opportunity to apply pressure to your high school players to play on the, that team, and and if they decide not to, you have the opportunity to negatively impact them. So it's a way to try to protect the players. So I get it. I get what they're trying to do with that. However, your point is well taken. Who is more qualified to coach these kids than the actual coach? Yeah, but don't the kids want to play, though? Don't most of the kids want to play in the passing league? Don't they want to play in the summer league? Well, they do, but then their parents yes. sometimes want to go on that vacation right. for two weeks. That well, and so be yeah. it. Well, right. and so be it. Yes. Or, or and maybe they're going to play lacrosse. Saying, yeah. or, right, and you know, yeah. wouldn't the coach have the same ability to apply the same pressure yeah whether he's there or not. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if the rules as they are actually protect, you know, protect it. Well, and we and you're 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 a, a teacher and and we have educators here. We have one of our guests in the audience is is a teacher as well. When there's a summer school class here at Sacred Heart or at a high school, do we have a parent come in and just teach the summer history class because we don't allow teachers to <laughs> teach in point. the summer? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, is, is that is yeah that i think the, the premise of, is a little different but well, I, I mean what well, the premise right. is you want the keith's point you want the most qualified people working with your children 
you don't want them. I just yeah, I, I just think it's off a, doing whatever if, if if you're allowing them to do. To the have coaches an are there. The coaches are yeah. in the building. They're on the field. Yeah. My other thing is this: How does the CIAC plan to police this up? Right. What are they going to send? Uh, honesty. Honesty, Keith. It's all about honesty. <laughs> They're going to send people to, to Killingly for the passing league up on one end of the state and down in London well, like, and down on your end of the state yeah. as well. So it's a it's a very, very slippery slope. Um, it's a year-round thing in my oh, opinion now. Year, so Every sport, which is a whole other yeah. issue, the fact that sports have become yeah, year-round. Th this but. is an approach I think might have been might have been warranted in the 1970s or the 1980s. But in the world in which we live today, it's, it's not really realistic. So why can't they change? Yeah, they should well, change. They, uh, the CIAC can change a lot of things, and I, I don't know if they will, though. I mean, there was the issue a couple of years ago with the baseball player. and He couldn't go to the MLB draft workouts because CIAC rule says if you're in baseball season, you can't do any other organized baseball. I understand why that rule is there, but there need to be exceptions to some of these rules. The kid didn't, couldn't go to MLB draft workouts or play in the 16th game of the regular season for the Berkshire League. I mean, come on, like, let's be honest here. And then that had that issue with the Bridgeport Central Boys soccer team a couple of years ago. They make that deep run. One of their players plays in an organized soccer game. They have to forfeit. I mean, you know, well, look, I think the you kids are look playing at each sports, each aren't they? Case it, it, as it's with its own They merits. should, but they don't. They, it's all no. one sweeping declaration. Well, right. you, you do have to worry about precedents that are set that may then you know, have unintended consequences. But I do think that more common sense, you know, I think would, would, would should prevail in these cases. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's face it, nothing, we don't live in a perfect no. society, so we have to police, we have to oversee, and uh, when you make sweeping uh, rules and regulations, you really, as an organization, kind of stepping aside and not, you're shirking your responsibility well, I think that's to, a to observe and monitor and, and, and correct when needed. I think that's what a lot of the CIEC does. I don't think that they stand away from all these issues, but you know they have the rules, and I think they let the schools and the conferences police themselves. Yeah. But I think there, there are times where you're kind of sitting there and you're like, where's the CIEC? Like right now it would be a great time for them to say something, and you just never hear from them. And to be honest, sometimes they never return phone calls. The events <laughs> that I go to, the basketball league, the football seven-on-seven, seven, the coaches are there. You know, listen, I'm not going to name names, but the coaches are there. They're watching their kids. Oh, everybody knows. They're watching yeah, the progress. Sure. And, you know, it, it just seems to me, loosen the reins a little bit. Let the qualified people handle qualified situations. Now, I've coached the summer league basketball. I haven't coached in 25 or 30 years. But you I are the doctor. Basketball. The I am the doctor. I'll help you out. <laughs> but you, you, the kids will get more out of blending together, I think, if they're hearing it from the voice. And that voice is their head coach. And the head coach is a heck of a lot more qualified than myself or, or maybe one of us guys up here. But I think that if you loosen the range, then you're, then people start to take advantage. You know, you, you give up one thing, then someone's going to take something else. And then slowly going to, you know. Agreed. I yeah, agree with you 100%. But in this case, I don't think it's going to hurt anything big picture. I think, I think big picture-wise, it'll be okay. I, I, I do agree with you yeah. that, you know, give somebody – an inch, they'll, they'll take, take a mile. mile. Yeah. But in this case right here, I don't see a problem if Dave Cornish from Ledger coaches his kids in the summer league. I don't see a problem if uh, Mike Ellis, you know, is calling plays at a seven-on-seven, seven, no pads passing league. I just, I don't see a problem. You know what, if a coach doesn't have the common sense to, let's say, let, you know, let somebody take a vacation in the summer, let yeah. let somebody out of, of the, you know, not, not be as demanding in the summer as during the regular season. Shame on him. If, right. Then if he doesn't have that common sense, he probably shouldn't be coaching. But and how many of these kids have their own personal coaches anyway, though? I mean, that's a whole other thing. But no, you, that's, you, that's you, go, you go to certain no schools. No one does. They, no they, one's got yeah. yeah. his own personal coach. <laughs> yeah. 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 Trying to see six strokes yes. off his game. Yeah. But that's well, no, that, wait, that, wait, that, wait, that's only called a life coach. I've only eight strokes this summer. No, no, I don't know. I have a life coach. Just helps me get through day-to-day stuff. Well, you know, certain parts of the state, we might be in that certain part of the state. A lot of these kids have their own flying around to go see other coaches in other states and other parts well, of the country. And they're able to I take, mean, take, they're able to take in, in, get involved in some of these showcases 
that are in faraway places that whether it's a lacrosse showcase or whatever it is that other kids may not be able to but that's just economics that's just yeah. that's just finances and the way that works out but you do want to see everyone have a chance and you want to see hey look at not to mention that these coaches and I, I have so much respect for high school coaches in all the sports because they're not making a ton of money no. they really are, are yeah, out there for and them. it's year round now no <laughs> these guys the preparation no, I, 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 apparently it's not they're supposed to be no, yeah. well apparently they're I didn't supposed tell to you that. So, so, you that. so give them a chance to make some money in the summer yeah why not yeah yeah why not well, that goes but then that'll goes into the school budgets and we know how tight those are anyway no, I'm saying in some of these travel teams oh, the that travel where they're not allowed teams, yeah. to coach, right? Yes. Yeah, that's that's where they can make some well, money. Which is weird, but that's a whole You know what thing. this show has proven once again, Noah? We're saving the world. Yeah. Oh, I, no, meant, no. I thought we were still going to have issues. <laughs> we, we always will. <laughs> are, we, are we like the Avengers? We, 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 the yes, but we will All be right. back uh, to, to, to deal with those issues, uh, certainly uh, in the very near future. We want to thank our guests for, for coming on the show today. Keith O'Brien, the sports doctor, Pete Pagagua, and Don Mamore. <laughs> And uh, buy his book. Buy yes. his book, yes. Right. A franchise, franchise on, on the rise. rise. All about the New York Yankees. Yeah, they, you know what? They may stick around <laughs> for a while. Yeah. They, may, they may make it in the majors. They won yet. a couple games. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be a fun summer, I know that. And it's available anywhere you can buy fine books. All right. <laughs> and it's a fine book. It is. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, for Noah, I'm Mark. And for our crew here at uh, CT Sports Now, and oh no, for issue for uh, we have issue. I have issues closing the show <laughs> on Vantage Sports Net. That's where we are. Until next time, enjoy Connecticut, everybody.